Time now for our Sunday morning Q&A, and joining us this morning is Peter Franchot, the Comptroller of Maryland. Good morning. Good morning, Deborah. Well, you're here with good news. There's a lot of money out there that may belong to a lot of people. I do have good news, because we have $58 million that we're holding for Maryland citizens. About 78,000 of them have accounts. We'll be putting out the unclaimed property list uh, later on uh, next week. It'll be in the Baltimore Sun. But we urge people to go and take a look and see if they're on it or their friends or their neighbors. Uh, it's, it's almost like free money in the sense that uh, there's so much there. Um, it may not be a huge amount, but yes. a couple of hundred dollars, it can really help. And I have never won the lottery myself. <laughs> yeah. but it feels like it, though. People have a good chance of winning on this one. All right, and we're just taking a look at the phone number that you can call just to find out if you have this unclaimed property, 410-767-1700, or you can go online sure. to MarylandTaxes.com, no, right? Yes, and we uh, are actually holding more than a billion dollars for a million Marylanders. Wow. Over the years, it accumulates. This is money that comes from insurance companies and banks and health care companies. When they can't locate an individual to return something to, they, by law, have to turn it over to us. And so we spend a lot of time making sure that people try to get reunited with their money. Right. I mean, you search tax records to find people. We've done that. That's a little bit cutting edge uh -huh. because there we're, we're actually looking through the tax records where we confirm that a person who's on our list is actually there. We will send them a letter saying, if you sign this and send it back to us, we're going to send you your unclaimed property. That's a little bit cutting edge, but we go to Timonium, we go to the state fair. We've done a video where we try to, in a good humored way, yes, I know, publicize this. This is a big thing for you guys. Now, I, so in terms of people can't really imagine losing this money in the first place, right. but you indicated how this happens. Well, sometimes it's just a couple of hundred dollars that a health care company doesn't yeah. have your new address, so the check gets returned. Sometimes it can be hundreds of thousands of dollars found in a safe deposit box of stocks or something that. I know it's hard for you and me to imagine this, but people forget. actually forget. forget. Or, or more likely, uh, someone has a life insurance policy and they don't tell their kids about it. Okay, I just want you to know I checked your list. Yeah, no, I'm not that, on it. Well, I'm not on it. Maybe, maybe uh, next year I'll lose some luck money. Next and time. Find it. Yeah, no, this is a good thing, and I hope everybody looks at the insert. I hope everybody checks out YouTube for the uh, video. We're going to put that out on Monday. And uh, if not, we're around at a lot of the county fairs Good. trying to uh, connect people. I think people are checking as we speak. Good. All right. So I want to ask you, one thing that is not missing is these prison meals. And it's been uncovered that the state that had approved, essentially, emergency contract with a food vendor for the detention center. Sure. And this was underbid, a three-year contract. And you called it the most troubling item that you have seen in nine years. Yep. What next and where do we go from here? Well, this is a big problem. It's a mess because obviously the prisoners have to be fed. They're going to riot otherwise, so we can't interrupt the service. But the company that was awarded the contract has acted, in my opinion, in a very unfortunate way and forced the state to up the payments by more than 50 percent. The governor on the Board of Public Works echoed my concern about this being a really, really bad situation for the state. So I'm not exactly sure how it's going to uh, unravel, but I've asked the Attorney General to look at it to make sure that it's not just incompetence. Uh, so you want a criminal investigation? I would very much like to have him look at this from A to Z and come back to us and say, look, it was just sloppiness, it was just incompetence, and nothing more. Uh, but someone needs to look at it. All right. Now, you are also Maryland's chief regulator of alcohol. You have yes. such an interesting job, really. I mean, people perhaps forget that arm of your job. And you've been very vocal about this powdered alcohol known as palcohol. Yes. And your concern is, you obviously wanted to mandate this initially, but your idea is to get this off the shelves in Maryland. Right. I, I'm lucky to be the chief alcohol regulator. It's a great part of my job. And I asked the industry, the private sector, to look at this new product. It's powdered alcohol. It's like uh, Kool-Aid, mm. except when you put it in water, it turns into an alcoholic drink. People with kids should really be concern because Absolutely. obviously this is not a good product. The private sector, to their credit, said, look, we think it's a bad product, too. These are the distributors, the wholesalers, and the uh, retailers. 
and they said we're going to have a ban on this as far as Maryland and they have enacted that and so you will not see this offered in the state of Maryland for sale. The legislature uh, understandably followed up with legislation which is going to I think have a moratorium or something to that effect but I'm very pleased that the private sector stepped up to the plate and said you know what this is a really bad product we're not going to distribute yeah. it and when they say that Deborah that's airtight. That's as, airtight. Uh, nobody's going to be selling this. And stuff. this was like the caffeinated alcoholic beverages that you got. Yeah, another with. incident. And and I love the partnership with the private sector because instead of the government saying you must do this, you just say to them, hey, do you guys think this is the right thing? Mm -hmm. And they came back and said, no, it isn't. All yeah. right, you were Mr. Summer. You, yes. Your idea was well, let summer be summer. School shouldn't start until after Labor Day. The idea went to Annapolis and never made it out of committee. Yep. So now what? Well, uh, there are a lot of good common sense ideas uh, that don't make it out of committee in Annapolis, unfortunately, because it's a different kind of universe. But the public loves this idea, mm -hmm. and uh, we're going to move it forward uh, somehow uh, over, uh, hopefully, in the, in the near future, because it helps businesses, because they have a full summer to make their money. It helps kids. And, families with small kids because it's very disruptive when you come back in August and then you break immediately for Labor Day. And it's good for rank and file teachers. Rank and file teachers love this idea because they say, hey, we need a rest. Mm -hmm. And right now the tendency is to come earlier earlier into August. Uh, so our very simple mandate would be start after Labor Day. All right, so you've got a plan B in the works. I'm uh, sensing that. Yes. Uh, we'll not, see. Not, not exactly sure what, what all the specifics <laughs> are, but we're I'm disappointed in the legislature, but I'm optimistic for uh, that the people are going to get this because they really want it. Well, thank you for coming in today yeah. as our Sunday morning Q&A. Nice to see you, <laughs> as always. Oh, thank boy. you. I'll Good be luck. looking for that money. I'll try and look again. Please do.